morning. morning. Blessing it is to be here this morning. If you're visiting with us, we'd like to welcome you. Kind of feels like it's been forever since I've been up here, so this is kind of strange. And I was gone for a little bit. I was at camp. Then last week we had a we had a, a combined service with the Iglesia de Cristo up the street, which was such an awesome service. If you got to be a part of that, such an encouraging, uplifting service that definitely demonstrated the unity that we have because of the blood of Christ Jesus. Once again, if you're visiting with us, we'd like to welcome you. See a few people that are back in town. We have some that are traveling. Want to welcome you guys back, and we missed you. Uh, and if you are visiting with us this morning, uh, there are visitor cards in front of you. And if you will, fill those out at, at this time. And when the uh, contribution tray comes around, if you will, drop those in there. So that way we, we get to know that you were here with us. We have a record of your attendance. Also, if you are visiting with us, stay with us a little bit after. So that way we can get to know you, and you can get to know us better as well. You know, I was... Uh, I was thinking as I was, I was going through this, uh, the verse that was read to us by our brother, I was thinking of the story that took place back in Texas, when I lived in Texas. And I lived about 30 minutes away from the Weatherford Correctional Court. And underneath the correctional court, there is a holding cell. And in the holding cell, this is about two years ago, okay? This jailer, he's making his rounds, and he's making sure all the prisoners in the holding cell are there, they're safe, and he has them locked in for the night. And then he passed out. Okay, it's in the basement, he passes out, and he stops breathing. And the prisoners, it was caught on video, the prisoners in their cells, they began to, they began to in the holding cell, they began to scream to try to get attention from people above, but nobody could hear them. So what they did eventually was they broke out of their prison cells to save the man. Uh, they, they did everything they could, they tried to get on his radio to call, and finally somebody upstairs heard them and came downstairs, and the man survived. The man was resuscitated. He, uh, he's doing well today from what I've heard. This was about two years ago. And I thought of that, and I was like, how many times have you ever heard of inmates saving the jailer? You think about that for a moment. How many times have you ever heard anything like that? And then I thought of this passage that was read to us in Acts chapter 16. You know, we think about the jailer that we read in Philippi, and we read about this awesome story that shows the grace of God and a man who asks the most important question that can ever be asked. What must I do to be saved? How can I have a song of freedom? If you have, if you have your Bibles with you, let's turn to Acts chapter 16. Let's look at Acts chapter 16, and we're going to be in reading in verse 23. Just to kind of recap a little bit as to what's taken place so far in this section. You know, this woman that had a spirit of divination, she's following Paul and Silas, and, and Paul and Silas, they get tired of it. Uh, you know, she, she's telling you, she's talking about them and stuff like that. So they cast this spirit of divination out of her, or her masters. They get infuriated about this, so they stir up this almost this riot, this controversy happens. Paul and Silas, they're beaten, and we're going to pick up in verse 23. And it reads, or rather, verse 22. The crowd joined in, attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. Now, first of all, I want to let you know something. Paul is a Roman citizen. He's going to talk about that later on in this section. But it's illegal to do this to a Roman citizen. So I don't know if Paul is screaming out, no, 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 I'm a Roman citizen. I don't know what's taking place. But whatever it is, they're not hearing him if he is is saying that and they're beating him regardless something else to keep in mind you know we read in scripture about you know if uh, when when uh, an individual commits a crime how many times they were to be beaten and under jewish law it was about roughly 40 times save one but then we look at roman law and mind you this is a gentile roman uh, city uh, in the city of philippi and when they did beating when they did that it was at the discretion how many blows was at the discretion of whoever was the official organizing it and so we don't know how many, how many beatings Paul sustained. What we know is that it says that they one day had inflicted many blows upon them in verse 23. I think this is interesting because it says when they inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Now, we meet somebody in the story. He's, he's the jailer, and jailers were typically veteran soldiers. All right, They were older men who were typically soldiers that had served most of their young lives in the service of the empire, and now they were relegated because of their age after fighting many years in conquest and battles against the barbarians, at one point against the Phoenicians, and so on and so forth. Now we're located in this role of being a jailer. 
And he's in charge. This jailer is in charge of making sure that Paul and Silas are safe, okay, because of what's going on. They want to keep them safe because they want to be able to see what is, what's taking place here, the city officials. And so we keep reading. And it says, having received, in verse 24, having received this order, he put them into the inner prison, which was the most secure part of a cell, was the most secure part of a prison in the Roman Empire, and fastened their feet in stocks. Something interesting when I was reading this, you know, they, all, the Roman, all the Roman jailer, the Philippian jailer, as he's also called, was required to do was to make sure that they were safe. He's a bit zealous. He goes above and beyond what he's told to do. What does he do? He puts their feet in stocks. He puts them in the innermost part of the prison, the most damp, cold, dark, scary, honestly, part of prison where you have no idea what your fate's going to be. You're cut off from everyone else. And he puts their feet in stocks. You know, when we think of that, we think in chains. There wasn't so much to constrain them as it was to torture them. Because what they would do is you would sit on the floor and they would spread your legs out as far as possible as it can go. And then they would bind you that way. So this is a man, I never really thought about this, but the fact that this man did this said that this was a man who lacked a lot of mercy and a lot of compassion and yet really, really, really was zealous in his job and went above and beyond what he was asked to do. And this is what's going on to Paul and Silas. And then we keep reading and it says in verse 25, and about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and they were singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Their backs are bruised, beaten, stripped, scarred from their beatings. Man, their legs are in pain. Their bodies are in pain. And yet their heart is filled with a song. Their hearts are filled with praise to God. And I, and I think about the other prisoners who are hearing this, right? I mean, they're so loud. Remember, they're in the innermost part of the cell. So they're screaming out. They're crying out and praising their God. And everyone in the cells, everyone else in the prison could hear them. And I think about how many times prisoners hear cries and curses, especially coming from that location of the prison, because if you were there, there was usually a chance that you weren't getting out. And yet that night, there was a different song sung. It wasn't the blues. It was praises. Glorifying an almighty God in heaven. And I think about that, how you have these two individuals that regardless of what happened to them. Now, I'm, I'm not saying I don't want us to get this image that, man, they were just like, hey, big deal. You know, I'm beaten. No, nope, I, I don't feel a thing. No, I'm sure that there were some trying moments. You know, Paul even talks about that in Second Corinthians, about how there were moments in his ministry that he was disheartened, but he regained strength and was filled with joy when he thought about his Lord and Savior. And when he thought about, regardless of his current circumstances, who he had in his life, regardless of what was taking place around him. You know, I guarantee you the jailer heard too. I guarantee you the jailer heard the singing. And I wonder what was going on in his mind. You got to remember the jailer, the, this Roman soldier was a pagan. Okay, he was uh, by, by, by accounts, you know, he was, a, he was a Roman. He was an individual who more than likely worshiped the other gods. He was an individual who his fate at the end of this life, it was going to be the Elysium fields, the, the fields in which it was the afterlife of the Romans that if you lived in valor and if you lived heroically, if you died in battle or in the service of the empire, that's where you were going. And he wasn't shackled. Paul and Silas were. And yet they're the ones who had a song of praise on their hearts. We keep reading. And I love, I love this story because then we read in verse, in verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors opened and everyone's bond was unfastened. Now, here's the thing about the region of Philippi. Philippi was this region in which there were earthquakes were a common thing. OK, earthquakes happen. That's what happened in Philippi. But Luke wants us to know Luke, the writer of Acts, is kind of highlighting to us. Look, there's something different about this one. In other words, look, regardless if this is just if this is just a common earthquake, if this is just happenstance, God's going to use it for something. God's going to take this earth-shattering, literally earth-shattering moment and demonstrate his glory to everyone within that cell and forevermore. We keep looking. 
And Luke continues to write when we read about the jailer in verse 27. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Now, the reason why he would have done this, okay, is because under Roman law, especially military law, if you were a jailer and if your prisoners escaped, okay, if they escaped, then you were going to receive the punishment that they would receive if they were caught. Okay, that's what would happen to you. Secondly, if you fell asleep on the job, that's a whole other thing. It's one thing of 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 being over, you know, being overpowered by the prisoners. But it's another thing that if you are caught sleeping on the job, you remember those who were watching Jesus's tomb overnight. If you were found sleeping on the job, you weren't even given the benefit of the doubt. You were considered a traitor. And you were stripped of your title as a Roman soldier. And the way you would die was not an honorable death. So you're thinking, you're thinking to yourself right now, and I thought to myself, so if he's going to die anyway, why is he going to kill himself? Because you got to understand, in Roman culture, in a pagan culture, killing himself, a soldier's death, was so much more honorable than dying the way they were going to kill him. And so to him, he's like, look, I may have messed up, but I can die right now. I can kill myself, and I know that I'm going to wake up on the other side of the Elysium Fields, And yet Paul, I think this is interesting. You know, as he's about to do this, Paul, you know, he sees this man in desperation. This is a man who probably spent his whole life devoted to Rome, okay? Who probably spent his whole life completely devoted to the empire, had given service, had probably fought many battles, had probably had men under him, had had men, had led men into battle, had probably killed men for insubordination, had probably ordered the deaths of many civilians, don't know. But what we do know is that this man, everything that he probably thought was secure in his life, suddenly, in a moment, came collapsing, right? And he thought he was at his wit's end. And he thought that this is, this is the only chance I got. This is it. I'd rather be dead than have to deal with what they're going to do to me. I've been, I've been the one that's always put people in stocks. I've been the one always torturing prisoners because that was the job of the jailer. He wasn't just the warden. He wasn't just, no, he was the jailer. He was also the torturer. He did different things like that. He was a man who was seasoned in battle and who better than a man who knew already how to kill than to be in that role and have no mercy whatsoever. He's probably thinking to himself, man, I've seen what I've done to people. I don't want to go through the same thing. But I love Paul. You know, we keep reading. And as we read, you know, Paul over here in verse 28 says, But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we're all here. You know, we were talking about how Paul is singing and Silas, they're singing in the midst of them circumstances. But you know what else I find amazing? That regardless of what happened, they still had compassion for this man. I think that's amazing. I, I find it amazing that Paul... Okay, Paul looks at this man, and it just goes to show you, man, that's the way Paul was. Paul, I think it's in Romans chapter 9, where he says, man, if I could allow my soul to be an anathema, in other words, if I could allow my soul to be cast away from Christ for eternity, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, I don't know if I can utter those words myself, but this is how much Paul loved people. And Paul said, man, if I could be cast into hell for eternity so that everyone can be saved, I'd rather that be the case. Because Paul loved souls. And when he saw this jailer, he didn't see a man who probably added more affliction to him. He didn't see a man who was a pagan, who hated him, and a man that deserved whatever he got. He saw a soul that he didn't want to see get thrown away. He saw a life that was precious in the sight of his God. I also wonder if Paul saw a little bit of himself. Paul was zealous, right? And he was unmerciful at one point in his life. Remember when he was persecuting Christians earlier on? And I wonder if Paul at that moment is thinking to himself, man, if God can save me, he can save him. So who am I to deny this man of help? We keep reading. And Paul, you know, after crying out, verse 29, the jailer called for lights, which obviously in, like I said, this is nighttime. Remember, it's nighttime. It's midnight. It is where Paul and Silas are. It is pitch dark physically, but oh man, the light is shining in there spiritually. But that's a whole other, that's a whole other sermon for another time. But when we think about, when we think about what's going on, you know, he says, turn on the lights. And so what does he do? He rushes in and trembling with fear. You know, the language here implies that this is a man who is completely shaken up. And you think about that. You know, this man, you ever been so afraid that you can't sit still? 
You ever been so worried about something that you can't seem to relax? That was this man. It was making him sick. He couldn't relax. Because all he could think of was, man, what's going to happen to me? Everything that I've ever trusted in because of an earthquake, it has all come collapsing down. I've done my job right. I've done my role right. Yeah, I fell asleep, but that's probably one out of a thousand times that I've, I've stayed awake. And now this one time, this one time can cost me everything. And I wonder if the jailer in his mind thought, you know, if, it's, if that's the case, then what's the point in all of this? And with fear and trembling, he goes to the two men who, even though that they were in prison, had a song to sing. You know, I envision him falling on his knees and he asks them the most important question that anyone can ever ask that's outside of Christ. What must I do to be saved? It's almost like he's saying, look, I heard you guys singing. You guys, man, I tortured you. You guys were beaten before you even came in here, and yet you still have a song to sing. How can I have that? Give me a song that I can sing. I wonder what they sung. You know, I, I do, you know, we know that they sung psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs like Ephesians. Paul writes later on in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19 through 20, right? He talks about that, that regardless, you know, be filled with the Spirit and even during hard times, sing and make melody in your hearts to one another and so on and so forth. I wonder what this man heard. I wonder what psalms he heard. I wonder what songs he heard about God it just made him realize, these are the guys that I want to talk to. These are the people that I'm thinking about. I've seen prisoner after prisoner after prisoner come in here, but these two men are different. There's something about their faith, something about their life, something about their hope that right now I lack. And he says to them, reading it again, he asks them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you and your household will be saved. In other words, it's like Paul is saying, Look, your hope has never been in Caesar. Never should it have been. Your hope is not in the Elysium Fields. Your hope is not in your job. Your hope is not in your career and your loyalty to the empire. Your hope, and only our, all of humanity's hope, is found in Christ Jesus and in Christ alone. I think of what Peter and John, you remember when they were on trial themselves, they, they, were, they were going through this period of prison and so on, just like Paul and Silas. And in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, they even say, Man, there's no other name in heaven, under heaven, by which men are saved. There's nothing else that provides the hope that Jesus can provide. And this man, who in a matter of moments loses everything and is shaking more in his soul than the foundation of the prison shook in the midst of an earthquake, wants something more. He says there has to be something beyond all this. There has to be something that is greater than this. So we keep reading. And in verse 32, it says, And they spoke the word of the Lord to him. They, spoke, they preached the gospel. And to all who were in his house... And he took them the same hour. So this is roughly, remember, we started the story about midnight. Uh, some scholars believe this is roughly about two or three in the morning. And he washed their wounds. Wounds that he probably helped to afflict. It's almost like this show of repentance, right? Like, let me help you. Because you think about it, before, he wasn't doing that for them. They were down in the prison stocks. They were down. He put them in stocks in the darkest, dampest part of the prison where disease could spread. He didn't care. He was doing his job. That's what he did. He was unmerciful. That's why he was the right man to be a jailer. And yet this man realized, I need mercy myself. And when he realized and saw what he himself had even caused uh, to these men, he couldn't help but to help them wash their wounds. Things that he probably afflict and added to. We keep reading. And it says, And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. You know, the jailer submitted himself to God, putting Jesus on in baptism, and couldn't help but share this new devotion, this new life, this new hope, this new song 
with his family, with the people of his house. Then he brought them up to his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. In other words, he rejoiced. That word joy, that word joy that we find there, you know, we often talk about joy in the Greek context of the word, right? You know, we talk about, you know, the book of Philippians. You constantly hear the word joy. That word that we find in the New Testament is never used anywhere in secular Greek writings. The reason why is because that word, we only ever find that word for joy in the New Testament. The reason why is because it's a different kind of joy. It's a spiritual joy. It's a joy that can only be found in one being, and that's in Christ Jesus. And this is what this man was filled with. Oh, he had a new song to sing, and his family did. And who knows the people that he would reach in the Roman ranks later on? Who knows the people that he was going to encounter and say, Look, I was an unmerciful jailer who needed the mercy of a loving God. And look where I'm at today. And he was filled with joy and peace. Regardless of the circumstances in his life, he too was able to sing a new song. You know, we think about the prison. This is supposedly the prison that Paul and Silas were in. I don't know. You know, they, there's a lot of those uh, kind of religious tourist traps, maybe. I, I don't know. But, you know, for the most part, this is what a lot of people believe. This was the, uh, this was the prison that they stood in, at least a cutaway of it. And you can see, you know, if that the entire thing was enclosed, obviously they didn't just leave, you know, it open for them to just hang out. It, the entire thing was closed. It is cold. It is dark. It is damp. You feel like you're in the center of the earth and cut off from everyone. And yet in that prison cell were the most free men in that entire jail. And then you've got the literal, though, the physical free man, right? The jailer. He's the freest person in the prison. He does not, he's not bound by shackles. He's got a good job. And yet he realized, I may not literally be chained, but I'm the real prisoner. I'm the true prisoner. And I need freedom. I need a new song in my life. I want you to envision what this must have been like for this man to have encountered Paul, to have encountered Silas, to have encountered these two individuals who I would have known. Who I, It's interesting to me how God can take some of the most random circumstances in Philippi. You think this man woke up that morning saying, you know, tonight my entire life, my foundation that I built up is going to be shook. And I'm going to have a new foundation, one that can never be broken if I trust in him. You think he woke up that morning thinking that, but it happened, right? I think that's amazing. You know, we think about the Philippian jailer. I wonder what it was that he heard that night and they're singing that pierced his heart. You know, I may be out of jail, but I'm in jail and I need a way out. And just like the earthquake shook the foundation of the prison, the foundations that he laid up in his life also crumbled. And there was nowhere else that he can look than up. I wonder when he asked, what must I do to be saved? Once again, the greatest question anyone can ever ask. It's almost like he's saying, what actions, what changes, what choices, what decisions in my life can I do and can I make to be able to sing just like you? I'm not talking about, I don't know how Paul sounded. I don't know. He may have sounded like cats being swung around in a bowling bag. I don't know. I, I don't know. That's a really, that's a, that's a weird, I just thought of that in the spot, so that's really random, morbid. But I'm just saying, I don't know what he sounded like, okay? I don't know what Paul must have sounded like, but there was something not in his voice in the sense of how he sung in, in the notes, but there was something in his heart that that jailer heard that night that he wanted to be a part of as well. You know, when we think about God and we think about all the things that he can do, no matter what happens in this life, what God has to offer in this life and the next, man, it is worth it all. No matter what may happen in this life, God can give you a new song to sing. And you may be sitting here, you may be sitting here this morning and you may say, I, I need that song. I need a song in my life. I want to be just like that jailer. I'm tired of the life that I'm living. I'm tired of the song that I'm singing because it's played out. I want that song. 
that Paul and Silas were able to sing, I want that heart. I want that hope. I want that life. I want that love. Yeah, and that comes through Christ Jesus. When the Philippian jailer asks, that question, what must I do to be saved? What can I do to have a song just like yours? They gave him the answer. They didn't lie to him. They didn't mince words. They didn't do anything but tell him the truth. You need Jesus. The only one that can heal and mend your broken heart and will take the mess that your life may be oh, and make it beautiful. Amen. But you got to put your trust in Jesus and you got to put your faith in Jesus and you got to obey Jesus. And that's what the jailer did, right? You know, he immediately, you know, he, he believed and he was baptized and he was rejoicing, filled with this immense amount of joy that cannot be found anywhere else on this planet but in Christ Jesus, Amen. the greatest source of joy the world has ever known. You want to sing a new song? We're actually about to sing a song. But if you want to be able to sing the song that we're singing, the songs that we've been singing, because sometimes we come here week after week, and I know I've sang songs like Salvation Belongs to Our God or How Great Is Our God, and I completely forget what I'm singing. I know I sing songs sometimes personally. I'm, I'm talking as Paul Delgado, not just a minister, but a brother in Christ. And I'll even be honest with you, there are times that I come here and I sing and, I've, and all throughout my spiritual life, and man, I'm singing a lie. And I need to, you know, not saying that what's the words on it is a lie, but my life isn't reflecting it. You want to have a new song? You got to put your hope in Jesus and your trust in Jesus. You want, to be, you want to be able to sing these words? I know this isn't what we're singing, Mark, but you know, the songs that are coming up next, you want to be able to sing those without a shadow of a doubt? You've got to put your trust in Jesus. That's why Paul was able to sing, and that's why people, I don't know if that was the only man whose heart was pricked that night. All we read about is the jailer, right? But who knows of the other men and individuals that were in that prison who said, man, I want that same hope. You can have it too. Let's come forward together as we stand and as we sing.